So the last challenge was to uh, survey um, verses 24 to 28, or really 20 to 28, uh, looking for a sort of logical progression in the way in which people depart from God and turn to sin. So we notice that verse 24, it says that God gave them up. Verse 26, God gave them up. In verse 28, God gave them up, meaning there had been a restraint of some kind by God, and God releases that. He, he sort of um, he unhelps. He, just, he determines not to help people be delivered from sin as they move farther and farther away from him, but he lets that happen only in stages like uh, falling over a waterfall that has multiple cataracts rather than Niagara Falls all at once. So uh, let's look at, uh, and, we, and, and we can notice that when he gives people over, it says that he gives them over to different things. In verse 24, it's the dishonoring of their bodies. In verse 26, it's dishonorable passions. And in uh, verse 28, it's to a debased mind. So they're clearly different things anyway that he gives them over to. So let's try and look at the progression. And I, I should say, I think this is kind of a, a fairly advanced level of trying to read and understand uh, Romans. It's trying to follow the progression of the argument or the sort of internal logic as you move from paragraph to paragraph. Um, but I also think it's really important to do that. If we don't do that, then we're not really navigating the book very well. Uh, if we don't see the sort of movement forward of thought or the logic as it sort of flows forward. Uh, so let's look at what the first error was. It says, uh, of course, in verse 20, that um, God, who is, who is invisible, uh, is nevertheless clearly perceived. He's seen at some level in the creation. Now, God himself is immaterial. He's incorporeal, meaning he doesn't have a body. He doesn't have a physical body like we do. And, uh, and so it's important that we understand of God, uh, that we conceive of God like this, that he is outside of the universe. He's not to be confused with the universe, uh, with material things. But the error in uh, verses uh, 22 and 23, where it says they became fools, it says that they, it doesn't say they became atheists, that they didn't believe in God of some kind. What it says is they exchanged the glory of the immortal God, the God who is outside of the world. He, he doesn't die like in a body. He's immortal. That God gets exchanged for images resembling mortal man, mortal man, birds, animals, and creepy things, meaning people began to think about God as just another part of the material universe, as having material, as having a body. And this is, of course, the way Egyptians, Babylonians, and Greeks, many of them, thought about God, that he, that Zeus, Jupiter, and so on are just living on Mount uh, Olympus, and, uh, in, which is in, in northern Greece. And they have a body, and they show up on battlefields like in uh, Troy, the Trojan War. Um, so by not thinking of God as outside of this universe, as in a reality outside of our universe, but as limited to being within our universe, just another material thing of the universe, notice what it says God gave them up to. It says he gave them up to the dishonoring of their bodies. You see, they now look at their own bodies differently. Why? Well, because humans are made in God's likeness after God's image. And if we're like God, it means that part of us is body, is material, but then another part of us is immaterial, is spirit, is soul. And it cannot be reduced to just a, being a part of the universe. So if you think there is no other, if you don't think God is outside of the universe, is eternal, and that you just think this universe is all there is and God just lives within it, then what that means is that our, our view of ourselves becomes perverted. We start to think of our bodies in ways that are unhealthy because we start thinking our body is all we are. Our body becomes hyper-valued, and the way people look at their body is to treat it as if it's the single most important thing in their life. And of course, we see that today. People who tend to be more secular, 
tend to place an extreme amount of value on health, on physical health, and on physical appearance, on images about of their own bodies. So they get a distorted view of their own body and thereby dishonor um, their bodies and themselves. The next stage is, uh, we have here just a slight thing I have to correct. I think it's a correction. Verse 24, there's a comma there. I think that should be a period, actually. And uh, the because bit uh, is going with what follows. In other words, this part here is explaining to us why. That's why it says, for this reason, God gave them up, right? So verse 25 is explaining why God gives them up to the next thing. So because they exchanged the truth about God for the lie, and here's yet another thing. Sorry to do this to you, but in Greek, that's a definite article, the lie. They exchanged the truth for the lie. And the reason that's important to note is because in the Bible, there's only one great lie, the lie. And it's the lie that the devil told Eve. Remember, Eve desired to eat of the fruit of the tree. She thought it could make her wise. And the serpent came along, the devil, of course, disguised as a serpent, and convinces her that if she takes of the fruit, maybe she'll become, I suppose, like the serpent in that he was just a dumb animal and now he could speak. It had, it had elevated him. And uh, if she took of that fruit, she would become wise. And he says to her, God knows this, and God is keeping you from this. So this is the great lie, that we desire something that's really good, and God is a killjoy. God is keeping us from it. And so we can't really be confident in God, not in his goodness. He's, he's kind of good, but he's not altogether good. He's He's trying to keep us down from what we know to be good and to be better. Our desires are better. So what does God give them up to by, by accepting the lie? He gives them up to dishonorable passions, desires, you see. What we desire, then, we think is the best, and it becomes hypervalued. My desires are better than God's, you see. If I was in control of the world and I had God's power, I could do better than God. I mean, I talk to atheists myself, and they say that if God, exi if God exists, he's terrible, he's awful, because he's not doing what they would want to be done to the world in the time they would want it done, and so on. So they elevate their desires above even God's if he exists. And what do people do when they exalt their desires? They, they, they start making desire itself the most important thing. And so what follows is women, right? Say women desire uh, sexual pleasure. Well, they can look to other women for sexual pleasure. They have relations with other women. And men can, have, can derive their desires from other men. What does it matter uh, what the source of the pleasure is as long as the desire is fulfilled? It doesn't matter if, if it involves adultery as long as the desire is fulfilled. And people now refer to love as if, as if it's just the, some potion that we have no control over. People fall in love with someone, they can't control that, and so they have to divorce their spouse and marry this other person that they're having an affair with, and so on. So you can see the confusion that follows there. And then the final thing is that they no longer even uh, desire to have God in their knowledge. They don't acknowledge God, meaning now they're atheists. They don't even really think God is relevant so even if there is a God, it's God is just a sort of impersonal force. He's not like the way we think normally about God, if there even is a God. And of course, many people turn just to flat out atheism and reject God altogether. And what happens when they reject God from their intellect? God gives them over to a debased mind. So their mind is now not functioning. It's like a car whose oil needed to be changed a year ago and it doesn't function the same way. And what follows then is a kind of volcanic eruption of all kinds of different sins, genres of sin, that sort of explode out of a debased mind. So anyway, that's one attempt to try and explain the logical progression. Now, we have one final challenge about chapter 1, and it relates to the verse here that's quoted from Habakkuk chapter 2, the righteous shall live by faith. 
And the reason we want to talk about that is because a lot of people will say that the Apostle Paul and the event, the gospel writers, the evangelists, will sometimes just cherry pick verses from the Old Testament. That's all they're really doing. They're just cherry picking verses where the verses originally had nothing to do with what they're talking about in the New Testament, and they just sort of like a, like pushing a square peg into a round hole, they just make it work. But really, in the Old Testament, the verse had nothing to do with what they're talking about. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of test that with this little verse here from Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. Um, and you're going to want to see, is Paul really just cherry-picking this verse? Now, in order to understand what's going on in Habakkuk chapter 2, just a little warning, you're going to have to read the whole of the book of Habakkuk and what the whole book is about and how that little verse fits into it. So it's a pretty big challenge, but it also is very rewarding to see what Habakkuk is talking about and then how Paul uses that verse. So best wishes, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.